uh, the new developers uh, would be um, would be scared because they don't know where to break these uh, systems. So this is a kind of uh, um, attributes of of a of a legacy system. Um, So I, I really like this photo. I don't know how much do you see, but uh, uh, I recognize uh, almost every every role uh, as, uh, as as you can uh, uh, utilize in a, in a software projects like uh, Norway's uh, um, doer uh, project manager who is always happy in the background. Someone who tries to uh, analyze the the uh, state of the system. Some senior people who who. WTF thing uh, and, and a scared uh, developer who, who realized what uh, he's facing. Another example, it's, it's, a, it's a quite tragic example, but it also uh, occurs a lot uh, with uh, big systems. Uh, this is uh, the biggest uh, battle cruiser that uh, Britain ever made. Its name is uh, HMS Hood, and uh, when she was uh, laid and uh, Sailors has a bit of dirty mouth, but uh, when she was laid, she immediately became uh, the, the flagship of the Atlantic fleet and sunk by a single hit uh, in the in the Second World War. So it, it was quite. Uh, oh, fortunately, you can't see it, but uh, um, one of the part uh, of the ship uh, had just one single hit, and and she was sunk uh, in three minutes. And it's the same with. Uh, with uh, big uh, applications, it's, they are too complex to, to um, do um, functional tests in every aspect to, to realize its flaws and, and, and risks. Another one. Uh, this is a core graph of a, of a popular uh, um, open source project uh, written in Java, and uh, the core graph uh, shows us uh, the dependencies between uh, between objects, which are uh, marked, as, marked with the uh, white dots, and uh, and the classes, which uh, have the other shapes. Uh, some of them are as a class, uh, some of them are, are uh, final, and, and some of them are classic. But uh, the point is, uh, can we determine uh, or describe the behavior of, for example, this instance? Probably we can't. and. Uh, and uh, it's really, really hard to write uh, behavior to uh, test uh, or behavior test uh, uh, for such software. Okay. Another, maybe a good example uh, for monolithic architecture is the Linux kernel. The, this, these numbers uh, demonstrate the um, changes in the recent uh, 120 days uh, in the life of the Linux kernel. It shows how many developers worked on it, when uh, it was released, how many lines were added, and uh, how much uh, was removed. And these are massive numbers. And uh, even if uh, uh, 2,500 uh, uh, developers contributed uh, to the Linux kernel, uh, only 400 made a significant uh, change uh, on it. That means uh, in the, on the planet, there's only 400 people, probably maybe 500, who can actually understand the whole architecture of such massive project. And it's fine for an open source uh, uh, project because, uh, because uh, you can enjoy the attention of, of uh, the developers of the world. But if you work for a um, client or, or you develop a platform and you do something very, very complex, it's, it's, that's, uh, it uh, inherits a, a huge business risk. So, uh, as a summary, what's wrong with the monolithic architecture? Monolithic architecture uh, intimidates uh, developers. It's, it's hard to uh, do changes uh, in, in uh, uh, these uh, uh, softwares. It's, it's Often they often uh, they have uh, a complex build script, and uh, it's pretty tough to deploy them. So if if you have a I don't know a, a, a massive uh, um, software which probably is some hundreds of megabytes or, or gigabytes, it, 
it's pretty hard to do continuous integration on such a on, <coughs> on such a system. It also, and, and this is a, the this is the toughest part. Uh, uh, it requires a long-term commitment uh, from technology. If you pick a programming language, you have to maintain it uh, over the life of the of the whole project. If you if you pick a, a database, it's it's really really tough to move from one database to another uh, because uh, all the components has to reflect uh, uh, to the new one. And because of that, it's you can't really do. Uh, uh, sufficient uh, or, or enough uh, functional testing, and if you do functional testing, because a system is 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 uh, is very slow moving, uh, it's really hard to hard, or or maybe you can't solve it because there's no enough time to run all the tests uh, between between uh, the releases. So if you have to, um, for example, um, uh, model uh, a user journey. Uh, with payments and all the gateways, and uh, this is a website, then it probably takes a couple of minutes just to create a user, tear down the user, um, and, uh, and uh, go through the journey, play all the scenarios. So if you, do, if you want to do a couple of releases a day, as Netflix or Facebook does, you, uh, you, you can't do this uh, with this kind of uh, architecture style. And, uh, because these uh, applications uh, are massive, if, if you do all this Scala or Java, if you do, uh, occasionally uh, some, some services need uh, a minute or half a minute uh, to restart. And uh, it's, it's really uh, tough to, to orchestrate uh, services or do load balancing because uh, if you have hundreds of uh, uh, servers, you, you just to go through uh, all the restarts uh, after the successful deployment, this, this just takes too, long, uh, too much time. And um, for developers, it's also a big problem. It overloads the IDE. If you import the whole project, because you want to um, see all the classes and, and uh, instances, when you, do, when you type uh, in, in the integrated development environment, it uh, offers you auto-completion and uh, if you have uh, tens of thousands of classes, then it it's just uh, makes the, uh, the whole system slow. Also scales inefficiently. So if you want to deploy and scale horizontally uh, these ap uh, applications, you have to deploy all these massive chunks uh, onto each server. And some parts probably are more heavy, some of them are more lightweight. So you shouldn't really copy all of them to in, in the same uh, uh, the same ratio uh, on, onto the same server. Some of them, maybe it would be enough uh, five uh, instances, some of them has to be deployed to all the servers to, <coughs> to have efficient load balancing. <coughs> okay, th this is a, uh, a quote from, from one of the core members of the Zero and Q team. And uh, uh, he says that the future of code uh, will talk to code, the future code is uh, distributed or the future code is chatty code. This means uh, um, there's a tendency to, to move toward uh, applications or, or services which heavily talk to each other. If you imagine, for example, if you want to log everything which happens in the system, uh, that's, that's a massive uh, uh, volume of, of, uh, of messaging. If you want to also um, do some or add some some flexibility in the system to alter some uh, uh, messages to, to something else. Uh, it's it's maybe doubles or triples uh, this uh, volume. And uh, then we reach to to the microservice. Um, it's uh, actually in uh, uh, what, what is a microservice? It, it's uh, it was a kind of uh, movement uh, to distinguish uh, the current state of service-oriented architecture and uh, the lean version of this. Service-oriented architecture started uh, from the paradigm <coughs> to break down the application into individual parts, individual deploymentable parts uh, or segregation on the operating system level. So classically this means uh, you have uh, uh, different uh, 
uh, runtimes uh, running in the system, and these uh, runtimes communicate with uh, each other. So according to Martin, the Fowler services are out-of-process components of the system. And microservice uh, uh, trying to do this uh, in the right way. Because uh, in the recent years, if you if you bought a book about uh, service-oriented architecture, it was more about business governance, uh, kind of uh, not necessarily not necessarily technically related uh, stuff. And the whole point is uh, is is to support uh, not just the business needs, but also also the the, the technical evolution and. Uh, the people who initi uh, initially uh, um, worked on or named uh, their products uh, uh, microservice, they tried to distinguish their big, heavy uh, services uh, uh, from, from their product. Are you guys in any way agree with this? Okay, so if you, if you use, a, uh, or if you try to ever integrate with big, massive systems, uh, Microsoft Dynamics with uh, Adobe Lifecycle. These these are okay. These are services, but these are um, um, applications uh, or platforms on its own. So they are integrating these are, are not necessary service-oriented architecture. Or word by word, it is, but but it's not fulfill the original idea. Okay, so why would we use uh, uh, microservices? This. Uh, uh, attribute or this uh, 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 explanation is this comes from the uh, SOA. Um, it's, you can deploy it uh, independently. That means uh, you don't have to buy the same uh, size of servers for every kind of uh, service. So some of them are more heavy, may require more memory. Some of them uh, uh, are more lightweight, and you can deploy them independently. If you have a version upgrade of of one moving part, you don't have to upgrade. All the parts, and it's it's uh, um, Uncle Bob Martin's uh, favorite uh, um, attribute of uh, microservices: uh, independent scalability, independent context. This is uh, if you do a domain-driven uh, domain-driven design, then you met with the idea of a bounded context. That means. The same uh, application can be approached from different directions, and you can segregate uh, uh, your application uh, according to this. And uh, that means uh, you might different might might really implement something very in a very different way uh, from one aspect uh, than from another. And maybe these use cases are also different. So different people, different systems could use uh, um, the service um, and. Uh, uh, you can do this with, with, with a service-oriented uh, architecture. And uh, my favorite one is simplicity. So if you develop something which uh, has a 10 million lines of code, uh, it's, it's really, really uh, hard to get into. Maybe it takes weeks or months to understand the system, and after a year you, you will still don't know all the moving parts of the system, because if you, if you work with uh, I don't know, 20 colleagues who who work on the same code, it just changes too much. And you can't really uh, pick up uh, the changes. And if you break down to, for example, two or 3,000 uh, lines of code uh, services, those can be delegated to maybe less senior people or new joiners, because it's easy to look through. It has a very strict uh, um, uh, scope. Maybe if, if the architect was a good one, uh, the contracts between between other services are, are well defined, so it's easy to test, easy to um, easy to understand uh, these, and uh, faster real time. If you do continuous integration, uh, it's it's a it's a key uh, thing. Uh, if you if you compile a, a massive Scala application, it might take an hour or two uh, just to compile it. It's a simply unachievable to do real continuous integration when somebody commits a new change and uh, uh, build script triggered and uh, it, it's provisioned to, to everyone. It just simply can't uh, happen with, with, uh, with too big application. Uh, and um, faster startup time. This is important if you, if you work for high availability and uh, it's 
quite obvious. If you if you do three or four releases uh, a day, uh, cache invalidation, the, the, the parts which are involved in caching uh, uh, are occasionally restarted uh, after every uh, deployment. And, and <coughs> sorry, and uh, it's uh, just it, you you can't do this with with uh, big uh, applications. So the good parts, shorter development time because it's easy to look through the uh, individual pay, uh, um, um, parts. Higher higher accuracy. So if you work in um, in a in an agile uh, um, project. And uh, or in a startup where you have very very limited uh, budget, then it's really key to get uh, or or explore or uh, uh, or or get feedback uh, from your idea. So this may, uh, this uh, because it's simpler, you can deploy it faster, uh, you can scale better, you can get feedback uh, um, earlier from the users, and this means higher business accuracy because uh, you can change faster. Better availability, because you can uh, scale the parts um, uh, against better strategies. Low latency. This can be a contradict, because we could expect, OK, uh, if we use services, then uh, the network is involved, or the net speed of the network is involved in the communication. But if you break down uh, into concurrent part uh, application, you can trigger uh, individual processes differently, and in an asynchronous way, at a point, you can synchronize all these events, and maybe you will, or not maybe, in most of the cases, you, you end up in a, in a faster application. Any questions? No? OK. Reusability. Um, this means if. It's, it's actually the same uh, principle of using shared, shared libraries. If you, for example, pick a one service like uh, sending a, a, a mail sender service, which I don't know has plugins for Mandrill, Sandwich, or whatever service you use, uh, it's easy to, to use this service uh, uh, for other applications. And if you have hundreds of microservices, it's probably or high, the chance. Uh, there is, these parts are way higher than um, than uh, if you would have a, a monolithic application. But there are some um, tricks uh, with microservices. You have to change uh, the way you're thinking because you can't really solve uh, uh, the new problems with the same thinking as you created it. You have to design good contracts. You, can't really, okay, uh, on the fly, I, I, I will send some messages. I will, uh, we will, you know, we will update uh, the API as we evolve. This, uh, this most of the time, uh, results a uh, bad or, or slowed down development. Because, um, as I said, there's high chance to reuse uh, uh, the component than uh, if. You, um, if you change something, uh, maybe other uh, components are involved. So it's, it makes a, a tightly coupled system. So you have to design your contracts uh, well, uh, or you have to do it uh, better than than, uh, than as you would probably normally do. Also, you can't let the integration uh, to the end because these systems uh, are the, the whole point of having this system. You end up with simply are faster and, and uh, more maintainable uh, system. That means um, you, you, you would probably design your contracts against another service. So if you don't really know uh, what you would uh, uh, integrate uh, uh, your service, then you don't do it any better uh, than the old uh, uh, style. Your team have to support it. This is uh, usually the trickier part because it requires uh, some kind of uh, paradigm shift uh, within the team. And uh, if you heard about uh, Conway's law, that means uh, your architecture probably, or there's a there's a almost hundred percent chance to, to reflect to the organization uh, organizational change. So to create a snappy, fast, uh, 
easy to maintain, agile uh, application. Your team has to be agile uh, uh, and, and, and flexible and, and snappy as well. And here are the ugly parts, which, which are the drawbacks of having uh, uh, microservices. Because you have hundreds uh, uh, of services, or let's say just 10, but you have uh, 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 50 servers, uh, then that means uh, you will end up uh, with a massive system of, of thousand services and you have to orchestrate uh, 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 this. And you can't do this without proper tooling. Uh, I mean, uh, like monitoring, logging, and auto restarting uh, tools. <coughs> and, and also <coughs> continuous integration is, is also a key because you can't really test uh, the, the, the system at this scale uh, without that. And easy to overview. If you if you check the uh, SOA anti patterns or uh, microservice anti patterns, most of them are are uh, coming from to overdoing things. So, for example, microservices uh, is about to break down uh, your uh, system uh, according to, to boundaries, context boundaries, uh, um, um, to, to smaller parts. But you can overdo it. You can say, okay. Uh, Back to the emailing uh, uh, example. If you have plugins, you might say, okay, then I will have a SendGrid, Mandrill, or uh, Amazon SES uh, service. And you, you can do it uh, endlessly. Then I will have a, I don't know, a, a TCP, DNS uh, service, and a UTP one, and, and it's, it's, it's just too much. And uh, one uh, other anti pattern is, is more about behavior because. Uh, Microservices allow to you to combine uh, other technologies. So maybe some task uh, is the most efficient to integrate in Java, but maybe other uh, other problems uh, have uh, I don't know uh, a Lua script or or whatever uh, or Python uh, uh, library. So why wouldn't you use that if if your developers uh, are are uh, agree with that? Then. Uh, you can end up with using very unstable technologies or, or um, you can uh, generate a siloed team where you use uh, all the languages of the world and, and, uh, but only one developer uh, knows, for example, Ruby, another one Python, another one C, and you will end up with a, with a, with a very fragile team and, and structure. And also, <coughs> you have to design a partitioning strategies. So the key problem is uh, not necessarily the context, but who owns the data. So if you, uh, if you do, uh, or if you denormalize your database, or if you have to implement uh, uh, around the context uh, the same, uh, uh, same entity, uh, then uh, you have to be very, very careful. For example, uh, a customer uh, entity or aggregate uh, uh, which service will own it? The, the sales service, for example, or the e-commerce service? So it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's a tough uh, problem. But usually the, uh, uh, you could end up uh, uh, implementing uh, the same entity in both uh, systems because you want to, be, uh, uh, um, you want to avoid the dependency on each other. So this partitioning strategies can be based on functionality, boundless context, data model, uh, uh, and uh, the most popular one is the bounded uh, context. And using data model uh, one is, is quite rare because it's it's hardly unlikely to have a system which just retrieves data or doing uh, uh, create a read, update, and delete uh, operations only. You want to transform this data, you want to uh, process this data, and the last uh, uh, case is only it works for, for, uh, for when you just retry and maybe insert or update uh, this data. And uh, there are some challenges. Um, you have to solve the eventual consistency problem. So if you have many services, there are always, uh, uh, they, are, they are not in sync. So maybe not all the service or all the database or all the uh, data stores uh, have the same uh, state uh, uh, in, in uh, every time. So you have to think about what will happen if, for example, there's a split in your network and uh, 
or, or within your data centers. And as I said, uh, it's also a problem how to segregate this data, how to deal with slow transactions. So you can't you don't want to starve uh, one of your components in the system uh, uh, just because something happens. So you have to fail fast. Uh, and also an issue with uh, pass delegation. I noticed uh, a problem when, uh, um, when uh, if there's a massive uh, uh, system, somebody might pick uh, a task one time. And if there's a a new feature request or bug report, he will probably uh, pick uh, uh, that bug report which belongs to uh, that function. It's, it's fine uh, until a point when uh, people feel, uh, okay, this is my service, uh, and if there's a criticism against it because it's too slow uh, or, or some, something is not good with that, uh, then, then he feels uh, uh, as a personal assault. So, uh, you as a team leader should consider to rotate uh, uh, the team according uh, uh, between, between these uh, components. And uh, so now we uh, know what microservices is. And uh, we probably created uh, in the system a, a couple of them. But, but uh, if you have a eventual consistency, if you have, or you can't trust uh, in the network, uh, uh, you deploy the, this application because there's no such SLA in your contract, then you have to be crafty. Um, and one solution could be if you use a, a, um, sessions in your load balancer. So if you, let's say, if you have, uh, for example, one request, and you have, for example, 50 uh, nodes in your system, then you want to route uh, the new request from the same client uh, to, the, to the same nodes. It's probably not efficient uh, um, um, load balancing, but you can avoid the uh, inconsistencies. Another one is uh, um, people often, uh, often uh, like the, the state machines, uh, but if you have a just eventual consistency, uh, you, you can't have state machines because your system as a global uh, don't have the same state uh, uh, in, in, in every node. Right? Uh, if you have a, uh, the replica of five of the same service, they might not in sync. So you can't rely on that. Uh, you you would uh, um, um, uh, you would get the same data back. So if it's, it's the same classic problem with the master slave replication in, in SQL databases. So if you want to say that, okay, the, the write operation uh, will always go to the master and the read maybe from the master, from the slave, uh, if there's a split between the two, uh, you, you probably uh, break your, your, uh, your application. And one solution could be the event sourcing. So you don't <coughs> persist uh, the state of your entities, but the events which transform these entities. So that means uh, you can replay these uh, over the time. It's the same concept what uh, what uh, SQL or, or traditional database is using when they do uh, replication. So you persist or store the, the events until a given point, and uh, then you can replay it. And the benefit of this, you can reroute these events. So if there's an event like the user updated uh, the profile. You probably uh, use a publish a subscriber architecture, and uh, this event uh, uh, goes from the publisher to the subscribers, and this is what you need to persist, not, not the state, uh, what data was actually stored in the database. But uh, you can also overdo this. If you don't take snapshots, you might end up with just a massive log, and if, if um, your uh, nodes are out of sync, then it, it will just take a, a long, long time to, to replay all these events. Does this make sense? Okay. So we are getting there, how, how we use uh, zero and queue. And uh, now we have uh, uh, services, now we do know how to uh, deal with uh, events and changes uh, uh, in the system, but uh, 
we need to somehow let these components communicate with each other. And the classic uh, answer to this to use uh, an integration framework like Apache Camel, for example, to, to uh, tie together these services, or using a, a more robust uh, uh, solution, uh, the enter uh, enterprise service buses. Both of them are built at over the top for this because we expand the very, very low latency. So for example, uh, you uh, 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 published a, uh, uh, not white paper, but a kind of advertisement of <coughs> uh, their solution. And uh, th they are brilliant. So, so I, I do love uh, uh, Mule. It's, it's not really against them. So if you check these numbers, uh, they have uh, 8,000 uh, uh, transactions per second, uh, two second response time uh, on system level, but uh, uh, just uh, six, sec uh, sorry, uh, six uh, millisecond latency. It, these are awesome numbers. So th these are quite good uh, for, for that uh, uh, 20 kilobyte uh, uh, SOAP uh, message. But uh, you need a 24 CPU and 36 gigabytes of RAM uh, for this test. So the test case is uh, published uh, or can be found uh, on the website. But it's, it's fine in <coughs> many cases. But uh, if you have hundreds of uh, such uh, um, service and uh, literally millions of billions uh, uh, events in your system, this is not good enough. It's, it's perfect for the classic integration uh, cases, but, but not necessary, uh, or, or it's just too heavy for us. So if you have uh, loads of events, uh, I mean extreme rates, so if you have thousands of services, uh, I mean in, in the whole system, uh, then <coughs> and if you do logging or you have uh, many publishers, many subscribers, that's extreme rate of events. Uh, how would you do fault tolerance? So if you have an ESB, you have to care about replication and 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 uh, all sorts of things. So it, it adds an extra layer of, uh, of complexity uh, to you. Um, one um, solution could be uh, NSQ. It's, it's, a, it's a message queue uh, like uh, ActiveMQ, uh, um, but uh, it's more lean. If you check the, just the last line, <coughs> that it can uh, uh, push uh, or its throughput uh, is for 2 million uh, operations per second, 40.8 uh, microsecond, not milliseconds. So it's it's uh, three order of magnitude faster than than a mule uh, solution. Of course, it's it's not that robust. It's it, it's uh, by default it's. Uh, uh, it's a non-durable in-memory uh, message queue, uh, but in 99% of the cases, it's, it's still fine. If you can do clustering, and it's quite seamless. It's written in Go. Uh, have you heard about Go, Google Go? It's, uh, it's a relatively new programming language which tries to the uh, garbage collection and concurrency by default. And uh, one of its uh, benefits is it, uh, you will, when you compile uh, your application, you will end up with one binary without any kind of uh, dependency. So there's no dependency on any other library, easy to deploy. And uh, NSC is written uh, in that uh, language. It's pretty fast. If you are unluck uh, unlucky, then you probably end up two or three times a slower uh, application uh, as you will uh, written it in C++. So it's pretty Fast. It supports uh, um, um, encryption. You can do streaming, which is uh, not uh, common uh, in, in the, the message queues, and and no brokering. So the whole architecture of NSQ is having uh, uh, it's it's actually consists of two applications: a lookup daemon and uh, uh, NSQ agents. And the lookup daemon is what you uh, set in your services, so they will query, uh, uh, okay, I would like to send this message. It will, your application don't see it, but uh, it will query, the, query uh, uh, an agent, a list of agent, and then uh, uh, it will connect to the agent. So it's quite seamless. If you 
uh, start a an NSQ agent, all you need is just to specify the by um, um, or in the simplest case uh, 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 um, a lookup daemon uh, address, and that's all, and it joins the cluster. Okay, so what's the problem with this? If you if you um, um, if you uh, do your programming in Google Go or Erlang, uh, which both uh, languages are, are support uh, concurrency by default, you probably can stop here because uh, most of uh, what Zero and QL offer is is uh, uh, happy with concurrency. But many languages like Java or C or Python or PHP, uh, these languages does not support concurrency by default, and concurrency is just stuff. And uh, these uh, solutions are still slow. So we classically uh, think about uh, how do we integrate <coughs> e-commerce systems or I don't know, uh, financial transactions. But what if, if, you, if you are an architect in a, uh, a game developer company? Um, milliseconds or, or seconds are, are, are just you no know, rule uh, in, in such applications. And you can also uh, uh, do uh, microservice oriented or microservice based uh, uh, architecture style in, in such uh, projects. And <coughs> also if you, if you uh, have to deal with concurrency uh, because your language doesn't support uh, using multi-thread uh, like in Java it's, 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 or, or in C it's just pretty, pretty tough. There are loads of uh, anti-patterns or, or ways to, to fail it. And uh, these are ch just uh, some of them. And log convoys or log free uh, reordering. If you want to reorder, for example, uh, uh, a number uh, without locking or, or an associative error, it's, it's pretty tough to, to make it uh, less safe. And uh, <coughs> yeah, pretty much it. But, uh, there's a solution, and the solution is what uh, I found is uh, zero and Q. And uh, it's actually uh, how they advertise it: uh, come from come for the networking and and leave it for or leave for for uh, for that concurrency. And uh, that means uh, um, uh, it's basically sorry, uh, it's a library. It does not have a standalone server, so it. It's, its name is, is quite uh, misleading. It's not a message view. It's, it's, a, it's a communication and concurrency framework. And uh, it acts like a tiny server in your uh, application. Uh, and uh, it deals with, uh, with uh, network sockets, or we will see a little later. Uh, but uh, um, it's one of its key uh, attributes is asynchronous uh, seamlessly. So when you, for example, bind uh, uh, to, to a port and you have a client which connects to it, the clients will only connect to it when uh, it, it transmits. And if the transmission fails, it will seamlessly be tried without any extra coding. And it has uh, more than uh, 30 uh, language binding. And some of them are not binding, but uh, 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 because Zero MQ is quite small, it's easy to rewrite in any other languages. So for example, the Java solution is written in native Java, and it's way faster than, uh, for example, um, than, than uh, a classic C binding. And uh, ZeroMQ has uh, uh, two kind of uh, components, main components. One is a context, and another one will be a socket. The socket will be uh, very different what you would expect uh, if you programmed in, in uh, Unix uh, uh, systems. So these are not domain sockets. They, they behave the same. They, the authors of uh, Zero MQ, they try to be, uh, um, try to implement uh, um, or, or create an API which is very, very close uh, in terminology uh, to see what uh, or sorry, uh, to, to the, the, the POSIX uh, networks, but, uh, but it's, it's not the same. So one is a context. Context is very, it's, it's acts, like a, acts like a container uh, 
for, for the socket. So when you, later we will see a code example, when you create a, a context, uh, it's, you usually have one context per, uh, per process, and you put all your uh, sockets into it. Contexts are tested, so you can share it uh, across uh, your application. So if you have, I don't know, uh, uh, 50 board bindings, uh, all your threads uh, can use it uh, without any caveats because ZeroMQ does it for you. And this is one of its uh, biggest advantage. Uh, you can do uh, concurrent programming without the uh, drawbacks on uh, the previous slide. Are you uh, familiar with uh, concurrent programming? Okay, so it's, please confirm it's, it's not an easy uh, thing. Or you are lucky, or base model. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, all right. So, zero MQ sockets. Uh, as I said, these are not uh, uh, Unix domain sockets. And I try to mark it with a bit of bold uh, font. Uh, what's the difference between, for example, a classic message queue? So we saw so it there are very, very fast uh, message queues. But uh, why uh, zero queues is awesome? Uh, because it supports uh, in process communication and uh, inter process communications as well. So it's not just the network sockets, you can do it. Uh, um, um, or you can organize your application in a, in a very different way. So for example, if you, if you want to communicate on the same host, uh, um, all you need is just to change the endpoint name. So we will see in the <coughs> later in the examples. And using inter-process communication or in-process fonts, those are way, way faster than using the, the domain sockets or TCP sockets. But you can also use a, uh, PGM and EPGM, these are datagram protocols. So, for example, you might want to, uh, you know, just uh, uh, publish events uh, in your system to, to, to your uh, uh, logger service. And, okay, uh, within a system, it's, it's probably fine to use uh, uh, UDP uh, packets because uh, we can expect uh, the, the system is reliable, and if the message lost, then who cares really? So it's it's not a, a, a big uh, disadvantage uh, to to lost every one billion uh, every billion uh, uh, I don't know user login uh, message. Maybe it's it's critical for for some some uh, cases, but in but there are ninety nine percent of the scenarios are, are not really uh, that mission critical. And uh, you can do also uh, um, um, multicasting with uh, EPGM. And uh, as I said, because uh, um, zero MQ is, is, is more like a concurrency framework, it, you can use the same socket uh, multiple times, uh, or you don't have to really care about who or which uh, thread is actually using uh, uh, those sockets. Uh, sockets are not trusted, so if, if you want to, um, if you want to expose uh, these sockets, you have to expose uh, the whole uh, context uh, to, to other threads. But uh, these are not tough. Uh, so these are not, so, these, so it doesn't add, add uh, uh, too much complexity uh, to your application. And um, yeah. all the network connections happen in the background. So as I said, when you connect your service or when you transmit it, you don't or you don't really know whether uh, it was sent or when it was sent. So these are asynchronous communication. It, that's why your application will be uh, way faster. And uh, the only drawback is you don't have direct access to these connections. So if you, in some cases, for example, um, NSQ uh, does not use uh, zero MQ, and why? Because uh, they wanted to tweak uh, these uh, TCP uh, sockets. So this is what you can't do with zero and queue. So if you want to uh, tweak the TCP headers or the IP headers in, in your uh, communication, this is this won't happen uh, with zero and queue. And here is a, a time example. It's written in PHP, and 
this uh, example contains a client, both a client and a server. And uh, it's, it's very interesting because you would expect uh, it's a, uh, so it's, you can actually run this uh, example if you copy and paste the <coughs> to a PHP interpreter here, you, will, uh, uh, you, uh, you can run it. And you would expect uh, this is a, um, a, um, a, sequ a sequential code, but uh, uh, the binding happens in the background. The connection happens in the background, and the real connection will be built up when you uh, send the message. And it's literally just down lines of code. And uh, here you can define the endpoint and uh, uh, or endpoints actually. And uh, why this is great because if you use uh, um, external configurations, we will see it later in an example. You don't have to change your application when you change the endpoints. So. If you, for example, have, or um, as I said, we we moved uh, from a, a monolithic application to to a service-oriented one, and we could do this without uh, really changing uh, the application. So when a new component was ready, then all we needed just to reconfigure the, the endpoint and, and the system uh, reflected to it. So. In between, we used uh, uh, an inter-process communication, but when we organize time to, to another service, then uh, it will end it up in a TCP communication. Or if you are sure your nodes are on the same server, uh, then you can use the uh, IPC. And uh, you don't have to change the code, and, and this, is, this is why we really picked um, um, zero and Q. And, uh, you would expect uh, the C uh, version of this, uh, because as I said, there are more than 30 language bindings on the original uh, zero Q is uh, written in C, and, and all, most of the examples uh, uh, in books are written in C. Uh, unfortunately, I can't scroll it, but uh, please believe me, uh, it's not more than uh, 30 lines of code uh, to, uh, to, to do the same uh, in C. All the <coughs> so the, the functions are quite similar. Uh, all the differences are mostly the the, the the attributes of the C when you have when you want to do a memory copy uh, uh, or you have to do explicit allocation uh, of the variables. Uh, this is uh, how you do this. Uh, sorry, any questions with the oh, for the examples? These are very very basic examples. If you have to specify all the endpoints that you want to communicate with, yep. how do you go about implementing something like Compete Consumer? Uh, there will be another example, or uh, at the end of this talk, uh, uh, I will talk about how can you do service location, or uh, what service locator uh, applications we, we tried and which one was the best for us. And uh, actually, uh, when, when you do the uh, connection, or uh, periodically you would uh, uh, get alerted uh, uh, from the service locator service. Uh, for example, a node is out, or maybe it's not replying, or you just took it down, then you don't want to try to connect to it again. So um, this can be automatic, and, and uh, this will be the conclusion. This is why uh, I call it as a, uh, um, this uh, architecture is an adaptive architecture because it, it can adapt to the, to the needs. So, uh, for example, if you have a monitoring service and you realize that you have a massive output, uh, or sorry, incoming requests, or the, the server loads are just getting higher and higher, uh, you can trigger, for example, to, to create another Amazon image or Rackspace uh, image, uh, deploy the, uh, the code and, and just set it in the service locator without any more steps. And uh, ZMQ, uh, uh, so out of the box there are three uh, patterns, uh, which are, I guess uh, most of you are, are familiar with. And uh, these are request reply for for classic uh, uh, client server communication, remote uh, procedure calls, or or pass distribution. So it's 
uh, uh, probably subscribe and, and pipeline uh, fan in, fan out, or, or actually sync uh, uh, um, use cases. And when you create a, uh, I don't know any the other examples I, yeah, so for example, you see when you uh, create a socket, uh, you create a socket push uh, and a, a socket for pulling. So this is where you define uh, these uh, communication pairs. So when you create a socket, so here is the same, ZRQ ramp, so yeah, so that, that will be the, 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 the pool version. It's unfortunate I can't scroll down, but yeah, it's, it's actually the same. So when you define a socket, you have to define its, its, uh, its uh, role uh, in the communication. And this is one of, uh, um, one of the zero and uh, drawback. Uh, you can't change it uh, later. So if, if a socket was uh, a push socket, then you can't really uh, use it for duplex communication. And uh, I just uh, picked the, the publisher subscriber um, uh, use case because it's one of the most popular one and it's quite useful in microservices and it, uh, it has some some uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, attributes uh, uh, in zero IQ. So uh, subscribers uh, can connect to multiple publishers with fair queuing. So when you do a zero IQ connect and you do multiple connection in the in the same uh, uh, context, it will be a, a round robin uh, uh, load balancing. So if you write a, if you have a, uh, if you run a three or four instances of the same uh, server in, in, in the previous examples, then uh, and you just simply multiply the, or copy and paste the lines, just change the port number, um, you will see a, a different uh, response. Uh, so if you have a Add the you know I don't know the port number to, to the uh, hello world and you will uh, see it's literally uh, just do a round robin and you don't have to do anything for that so it's it's a it's a sequential code but it's it's not <coughs> like that that's why it's quite powerful you don't have to uh, deal with threads you don't, and in some languages it's quite tricky like in PHP so for example our uh, Previous stack was written in PHP, and, and doing uh, uh, concurrent stuff is just simply impossible or quite unreliable. I would say so. This this was a big help to to eat the elephant. Um, if uh, no subscriber connected, the uh, publisher drops the messages. So it's it can be tricky to to uh, you have to start your clients first than your publishers if, if you want and you orchestrate the services. If you don't want to lose any any message, you have to start the subscribers first. And as I said, because it's it's not a synchronized uh, communication, when you connect uh, to a service, if it's, it doesn't exist, it doesn't matter. What matters is uh, when you, uh, for example, send or do a transmission to, to another service, then uh, uh, that service should exist. If it doesn't exist, then, then the ops of the uh, use case will drop uh, the message. And uh, if uh, there are multiple uh, clients, but for whatever reason uh, the, the connection is stalled, then uh, zero and uh, do uh, queuing uh, in the same process. So it's not something which is in memory or whatever where other processes can connect into, but you, you don't have to be afraid uh, if there's a, I don't know, Three second uh, um, outage in, in the network connection, you will lose the messages. And uh, what is uh, quite powerful, filtering uh, happens, uh, uh, sorry, this is wrong, so it happens on the server side. So when you uh, say you, you want to subscribe to a given channel uh, in the pop uh, so you want to only filter to, to certain messages, uh, it's filtered on the publisher side, not on the client side. So you, uh, it's, it's way more efficient than receiving all the messages and you will discard it because it's, it's not for you. Okay, so one trick is uh, what you have to consider when you create a such low level uh, um, uh, communication in your 
system is, is the heartbeat. What happens if uh, you don't transmit anything? Uh, in that case, uh, um, zero MQ will, will uh, drop the connection and it will build up again when, uh, when you transmit something again. But it might not be, really, uh, so in some cases, uh, you might want to keep alive these uh, uh, sockets. So what, uh, what's best is, uh, especially if you have uh, multi-part uh, messages, to, to, to do a ping-pong uh, when you are idle. So if you, for example, transmit a, you know, a five uh, gigabyte of data, uh, then you probably would break down into chunks. And if for whatever reason the, the, uh, one of the side does not recognize a new, uh, a new chunk, then it will send a ping and it starts a pong. And if the, the pong is, is not coming, then you know this connection is stopped. So this is a good uh, uh, idea. And um, um, so zero MQ sends uh, messages and not bytes. So if you uh, did uh, TCP communication or UDP uh, um, in C or C++, uh, you transmit bytes, but uh, zero MQ sends messages. So for example, if you send a chunk of message, uh, it uh, stores in the memory, and then it will transmit it in, in one go. So it, you don't have to uh, manually or, or actually you can't do uh, streaming in, in zero MQ. And zero MQ cares only about the transport, so it's a binary transport. And uh, you have to specify the format. It's not SOAP, it's not REST, it's, it's very lower level. So if you want to send a binary, literally the bytes uh, will go there in the same format as you, as you submitted it. And, uh, um, yeah. So you need to define the protocol uh, between uh, these services. So as I said, you transmit actually binaries or in, in row mode uh, the data. And uh, if you want to create a, a kind of uh, language between, between the client and server, you, you need to specify the data format. And there are a couple of uh, projects, uh, open source projects, which are available uh, for us and, and has the work. One is the Google's invention, or invention idea, uh, is the protocol buffers. And uh, it's actually uh, just, uh, um, you, you have a protocol definition in a text file, and uh, um, um, using uh, the protocol buffer uh, tools, if you uh, create you uh, um, um, uh, um, a protocol. So, <laughs> so using protocol buffers, uh, uh, you define the, the protocol in a text file, and both your client and uh, server will or can use it. In this protocol buffer, you can define uh, integers or text or, or row bytes, and uh, when you parsing this message, you you can easily understand on the both sides. And it's quite fast because, because it's, it's sort of binary. Another one is the uh, uh, Thrift. Um, it's more heavier um, than uh, um, protocol uh, buffer. I mean, it's a server stack. No, sorry, it's an application because in general it's <coughs> US code. It's, it's similar like when you use the visual files for, for SOAP. Uh, if you have the visual file, you, you can generate the, the client uh, uh, based on it. And, and it's uh, quite similar. You describe in a text file the protocol, okay, I would send, uh, uh, um, I don't know, uh, 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 first name, string 32 characters, last name, string 32 characters, and, and uh, it will generate you both the, the server and the client code in, in many, many languages. But uh, from zero MQ perspective, uh, uh, this is out of the top because it won't generate you uh, a zero MQ uh, client or zero MQ server, but what you can utilize if you check the source code, you can uh, copy and paste the, uh, the, the relevant uh, generated code for the, for the protocol. Um, does this make sense? Is it? Yeah, okay. So, 
interesting Xenon queue use cases. Um, you can, uh, for example, uh, use two loggers now, uh, to which can listen to Xenon queue, uh, and you can directly communicate uh, with these loggers uh, with, with Xenon queue. So normally you would uh, um, push it uh, using the syslog um, commands or, or just push it into into uh, by TCP to, to uh, an R system or a system NG servers, but uh, using zero MQ, it's, it's more easy to configure whether the logger server is on local host or remote or whatever. Another one, which is uh, one of my favorite, is a Cucumber plugin. You can, uh, Cucumber is a behavior driven testing, uh, behavior driven design testing. Uh, Tools so you can, in Gherkin language, you can you can write your test scenarios and and uh, run uh, Cucumber and it will test uh, uh, your application uh, and uh, you can write uh, uh, or you can test your your contracts or or, or your protocols uh, via this plugin. So you need to install this child. It's written in Ruby and uh, it's. Uh, it's, it's pretty pretty good because otherwise how, how would you it's, uh, in, in other languages it's or sorry in, in, in other use cases it's pretty tough to to, to uh, verify or do functional testing on binary protocols and uh, there are two web servers one is uh, Brittany Ruby another one is uh, is uh, engines uh, uh, on famous uh, um, HTTP server. And both has uh, now zero MQ uh, um, plugins or transports. The benefit is uh, engines can alert your application, not, for example, invoking uh, via uh, a CGI um, uh, instance like in PHP running uh, PHP F, uh, uh, FDM, um, sorry, FDM. So, but directly communicate to your service, not via TCP, but uh, via zero MQ. So if you, if it's a uh, the same host, uh, if, if this connection will be faster. You probably spare some some milliseconds of uh, communication, which might matter. As and uh, some limitations, as I said, uh, there's no stream oriented uh, request reply, and uh, you can't. Uh, uh, reverse uh, the request reply rules. So you can't say, okay, now I'm the server, run the client, and it will do a change. And uh, you can't uh, manage uh, the sockets uh, manually, and you, you can't do multiplexing. And uh, okay, now we have microservices, now we can communicate with them in an efficient way. and. How can we make this uh, system adaptive? And this is where uh, what we talked uh, uh, some minutes ago. Um, there are a couple of tools what you can use to, to for configuration. Uh, these two tools, Puppet and Chef, they, they are quite popular to use uh, them as a configuration management tool. Uh, Puppet uh, uh, both can have a, a master slave uh, or a master agent uh, uh, um, uh, set up where, for example, you have a puppet master and all your uh, nodes uh, have uh, an agent and, uh, and the agent reach either from the catalog uh, the service configuration for your web server, for this and that. You can specify, okay, this node is, has the role of, I don't know, this is a web server, this is a blog stash uh, server. But the problem is, uh, because these catalogs are pulled uh, periodically, like every five minutes, every 10 minutes, and applying these configurations uh, uh, are, are uh, sometimes takes uh, a minute. So it's not really efficient uh, to, to use, uh, to orchestrate uh, or, or use them as a service locator uh, tool. Another one which is, which is uh, uh, very well known is originally developed by Yahoo for, for the Hadoop project uh, is the Apache Zookeeper and uh, it's, uh, it's written in Java, it's quite heavyweight, it's robust, it's, uh, it's consistent, it's, uh, um, 
uh, it has a strong uh, consistency. That means if you have uh, multiple zookeepers, the configuration, uh, so if, for example, one uh, application changes the, the configuration setup, let's say, okay, I'm shutting down, so I want to remove myself from the, I don't know, uh, um, mail server pool or mail service pool, uh, all the zookeeper will be in sync. Uh, and, but this, uh, um, this uh, solution is quite heavy. Uh, I mean, it's literally 100 and 200 or 300 megabytes uh, in the memory. If, you, if, you, if budget is, matters to you, and uh, most of, for most of us uh, it matters, uh, you probably have to buy a, a higher level instance uh, for, or rent a, a higher level instance from Amazon uh, just to, to use this. It's not really uh, cheap. Another one is, this is a new project called ETCD. It's uh, also written in uh, Google Go. It has one binary, and uh, it's using uh, the REST algorithm for consensus. So for example, when, when uh, you use a database service, they try to, uh, they try to determine who's the master, and uh, who, uh, yeah, who, who's the master in, in the communication, and the, this called consensus, or quorum. And uh, there are uh, popular uh, algorithms for this. One is the Plexus, uh, and it's, it's very used, but it's quite uh, heavy, and it takes time to, to, uh, uh, to, to get this consensus from the, ser from the server. So if you, for example, use MongoDB, uh, it might take uh, half a second to determine who is the master now if you have a, if you have a cluster. This is uh, maybe not something you want. Uh, and uh, Braft is uh, a bit, uh, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a different approach, it's very simpler and it's easier to, to implement. Uh, the problem with Plex is uh, almost every application has a different idea how it should be implemented. And uh, um, yeah, and it's, uh, it's open source, uh, it's written by the Vagrant uh, team. So if you use, uh, if you do development, you're probably familiar with the solution called Vagrant. It's, it helps you to have the same environment for everyone and probably you will have the same uh, setup in your laptop or in your uh, dev environment uh, as the server. Okay, another one is the code console. It's also open source, written in the same language, uses the same uh, raft uh, consensus, consensus algorithms. Uh, algorithm. um, you, when you use console, uh, it's you can run it in an agent or in a server mode. When servers are strongly consistent, but agents are, are not, but uh, they use a, a protocol called uh, uh, Whisper. And uh, if you have hundreds of nodes, so if you have a massive scale, maybe global hundreds of servers, uh, you can't really do uh, strong consistency because, uh, because it's just not uh, really feasible. So um, then, uh, the, the gossip uh, protocol, uh, what it does is always uh, uh, consistent with the, with the nearest uh, uh, neighborhoods. So if you are in the, on the same network, it will shout uh, to all the agents uh, something has changed, and they will uh, spread uh, this to the, to the other uh, agents. And maybe uh, there's a, a, a console server in every network, so it will eventually consistent within, within sub-seconds, but it's, it's very uh, faster than, than ETCD. All these uh, setup, or mm, what we use uh, these, uh, to, to expose uh, their settings in the environment, the environmental variables, so your application can query uh, um, the changes or the extra actual state of the, of the configuration. And it's, it's not, these are not a replacement for Puppet and Chef. These are just for service location and, and orchestration. And uh, here's the end. Any questions? That's all clear. <laughs> um, I think you touched briefly on uh, some of the drawbacks of microservices yep. and specifically talking about you know that you need extensive tooling. Yes. Um, 
one of the biggest challenges uh, we found work, in my work is um, kind of managing the deployment process. It sounds really great. I mean, we're trying to sort of get there. We have this idea of how good it will be once we can deploy everything separately, but everything gets tested at the same time. I think it's integrated together, but then you also when you've got to run it on your uh, local machine and all this sort of thing. What sort of challenges and tools uh, more specifically are there for that, that process? What, what we use uh, is Docker. Uh, as a, it's, it's a virtualization technology uh, uh, written for, for Linux, so it runs Linux only. And if you have Mac, uh, then there's a tool for that called Boot Docker. And uh, you can boot up a very, very thin layer of Linux and, and you can run many Docker in it. The, the benefit of uh, uh, it's, it, you, you have, a, uh, you don't have to segregate the memory or allocate CPUs to, to the virtualization. So all the process will see uh, all the CPUs and all the memory. So uh, it's not as strong. So if, you, if it's a concern for you, you, you can use SAM or, or other. Uh, VMware or whatever you prefer, but we use Docker. But Docker has a plugin for Vagrant. So, for example, if you want to uh, uh, do a test or you want to simulate your your infrastructure in your dev environment, this is a very very lightweight uh, solution for that. So you do a Vagrant uh, app. Uh, it will boot uh, your uh, infrastructure. It will start the containers. So they will, they will see or they will uh, appear as an as a individual node between your uh, um, VMware or whatever, and, and uh, uh, that's all. So uh, this is one of the one of the tool uh, what we use. We use uh, Puppet for for configuration. So if we want to provision a new change, uh, then then we, we we just use it, and we use a console for for communication between between. Uh, so uh, for, uh, for service location and uh, Jenkins for continuous integration, Capistrano for deployment. So, for example, if there's a Git commit, uh, the Jenkins will pick up uh, it via a, a, a Git uh, post uh, commit hook, and uh, it will uh, do a, um, um, a build and 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 deployment. And yeah. Idea just to follow up. So I'm just uh, wanting to imagine this. So you've got many different microservices. Yes. Um, you make changes to one. I imagine it has its own test suite. Yeah. But then, uh, obviously, it could have some effect on some of the other services. So is there like also a kind of that, that's usually a sign of bad design if you have uh, dependencies on on other services. I mean, uh, if you, have, for example, have a chain of dependency, then you didn't solve the problem, just you segregated it. Well, I guess if you changed, if you were to change the API of the, of the microservice yeah. and something else is... Well, one trick data. is to, to version your API. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we do an API versioning, for example, on our REST uh, interfaces. So if we, or, or in ZRMQ, if you want to add uh, something else, we try to be back uh, compatible as possible but if if, uh, uh, if it's you know, impossible you can do it in service locator level so you can say okay uh, the version one will be deployed on these ports and version two will be deployed to those ports and if you uh, do a deployment of the client applications or the services then all you need is just to know which version are you compatible with. okay so they're very much plug in like plug and play pluggable into yeah it's, it's not easy it's, it's, it's <laughs> the biggest biggest or the toughest part of the of the, of the microservices how do you orchestrate this and you know if you have literally thousands of services it's it's, it's just something you can't do it manually so you have to uh, automate it yeah so and, and just to clarify then i mean uh, i'm not sure uh, it is designed in such a way that you really do just have to test the microservices, and then there is, you don't need to test some sort of overarching application or the way no, they use it. And it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's quite good because for unit tests, you, you can uh, uh, test uh, the, the internals of, 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 a, of a service, but from at the end of the day, what matters is uh, uh, how the whole service operates. 
And if you want to do a PVT test, a performance a volume test on in the whole global system, is, is maybe it's, uh, it's very expensive. Maybe you will run it a, a day or two if you want to do a Christmas or uh, Black Friday test. Uh, and it's pretty expensive and you, it requires a serious effort from, from the team to, to create a clone of your actual live environment. Uh, but uh, using uh, a small uh, functional test, which tests actually the, the service, uh, um, it's, it's also, also perfect if, if, if your contracts are uh, defined. So you do know, uh, because these services are, are separated or partitioned uh, uh, around a, a context, and that context can be, can be really well defined. So the, all the business scenarios, it's very easier than run a whole uh, suite of all the permutation of cases what will happen in the system, and you can still, uh, and you will still unable to test uh, 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 you know, the, the internal or, or the integrity of the whole system. If you uh, want to apply the chaos monkey practice of Netflix, who, who uh, if you are not familiar with that, and they employ uh, people who just literally plug out cables from data centers or just shut down the, the electricity and to test how, how the system uh, uh, behaves uh, in such critical uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, you can't do this uh, with, with uh, or, or you can't really prepare the system. What will happen if some of the services are not available? If you want to do, uh, you know, an end-to-end -end test. Thanks. Okay. Any other question? Uh, okay. you, you mentioned before that you need to design the contracts and yeah. that you can't leave the integration, integration to the end. That. So. The yeah. whole point is uh, for microservices. Uh, so if you if you do a classic uh, service oriented architecture, you may, may have four or five different components in the system, but uh, here you have hundreds. And if you do heavyweight uh, integration tools, uh, which maybe add I don't know uh, uh, ten uh, uh, or hundred milliseconds each, you will end up uh, uh, three seconds of of, of uh, you know a delay, which is uh, unacceptable. If you, if you develop games or just classic web application. So that's why I said your contract has to be well defined and you have to think about how <coughs> you integrate these services. I'm not talking about to expose an API and let system integrators to, to, to deal with it. I'm talking about how your US uh, system architect or, or, or software architect has to design uh, these contracts to be as efficient as possible. But what, what do you usually do because that that sounds a bit like a big upfront design uh, in a way. Or you're, what you're saying is that you're based on, on the services that you have at a particular moment and then let them it's, go. It's more about you know the define the protocol mm -hmm. and, and not really the implementation. So so um, and, and that protocol should be should be stable and, and hard to change. So uh, it, I, I don't mean that uh, uh, if you have, uh, for example, a service and, uh, and you do address, the, you, you, you are uh, based in UK at the moment, but you open up a, a new office in, in Frankfurt, for example, and you have a you have to use a different uh, Postgre Luca, uh, your mm -hmm. API uh, can't change to reflect to this, but. Uh, 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 you have to think about uh, this upfront, uh, 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 otherwise uh, uh, you, you won't have any benefit of using microservices. Did I answer? Yeah. Are there any integration frameworks that can actually plug in? So for example, we use ActiveMQ and Apache Camel at the minute, yeah. and one of the benefits is we can easily wiretap a message, enrich it, transform it, and, and pass it on to the other service. Yeah. Um, is there any way to do that, or is the expectation that you maybe build another a microservice to do that transformation, or else basically handle? Uh, yes, uh, sorry, I, I forgot to mention uh, uh, ZMQ uh, uh, has a, a special uh, routing uh, uh, mechanism. I, I, I forgot to add this, sorry. It, it's in the previous version, it, it wasn't there, but now it's there, and it's called proxy. So if you want to, for example, uh, have a, an intermediate uh, ZMQ uh, 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 service, a very tiny one, just to uh, or distribute, redistribute uh, these messages. Uh, yes, you can, you can do it, and it's pretty likely. And uh, yeah, it's, it's it's very more efficient than connect everything. Uh, with, uh, with, uh, so if, if you want to, you know, uh, just yeah, fan out uh, with, with a proxy and and, and, and the same, 
then uh, yes, you can you can do that, and, uh, and it's, I guess it's just fifty lines of code. Okay. Okay. If there's no other question, then thank you very much. Thank you.